Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our presentation on Making the Difference, Preventing Youth Suicide and Promoting Resilience. We are honored to have Dr. Scott Poland with us today. He's the co-director of the Suicide and Violence Prevention Office at Nova Southeastern University. And I'm really um, excited for this webinar as I feel it is such an important topic for us to talk about. It's an often difficult topic for us to talk about, um, but it is one that our children and their families often face. And it is really important for us to learn about the signs and what we can do and, and how we can work with our youth as they might be struggling with thoughts of suicide or self-harm and, and how we can support them and what we need to do and what we can look out for. Um, Dr. Pollan is an internationally recognized expert on school crisis and youth suicide and has authored five books and numerous chapters on the subject. He previously directed psychological services for a large Texas school system for 24 years and is the past president of the National Association of School Psychologists and a past prevention division director for the American Association of Suicidology. He recently authored the Suicide Safer School Plan for the Texas and the Crisis Action School, school Toolkit on Suicide for Montana. He is a founding member, member of the National Emergency Assistance Team and has assisted schools and communities after many tragedies such as school shootings, suicides, and acts of, acts of terrorism. He is very dedicated to prevention and has testified about the needs of children before the U.S. Congress on four different occasions. He's also been involved as an expert witness in numerous legal cases where schools were sued following a crisis. He has received the Houston Wage Peace Award and the Parkland Helping the Community Heal Award. And we are so lucky that he has joined us in um, this presentation and bringing this really important information to you all. So I thank you for attending today and thank you, Dr. Poland, for joining us. Um, I do have two polls to kind of help us out real quick to kind of get an assessment of our audience and see um, where everybody is uh, in regards to the presentation. So we're gonna start the first one real quick. Um, and I just realized I forgot to introduce myself. For those who may not know my voice, my name is Kristen Solomon and I'm the Acting Director of Operations for the Guardian Ad Litem Program. So real quick, we're gonna start the polls right now. Wonderful. So, Dr. Poland, just for your information for everybody else, about 50% um, or a little over 50% of the attendees are staff, both of our attorneys and our child advocate managers, and then the other 40% are our guardian ad litem volunteers. So, thank you all for joining us today. And then I've got one more. Okay, so we're real close um, to about 50% have interacted with a suicidal youth before and about 50% have not. So um, a, a large, you know, portion of our audience has interacted um, with a youth that was having suicidal thoughts or behaviors. And um, so I really appreciate everybody joining us today. And you know, for those of you that haven't, um, hopefully this presentation gives you some insight and some tools in case you do. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Scott Poland, 
If you have any questions, um, like our other webinars, you are on mute. Um, please use the questions section on your panel to ask us questions, and we will answer them towards the end of the webinar, um, and we'll go from there. If I don't get to your question, we will get back to you after the webinar, and I'll respond to those questions individually. Dr. Poland, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Kristen, and for everybody who's tuned in today, we can all make a difference in youth suicide prevention, and somehow. I doubt that I'm the only person on the webinar today that lost a loved one to suicide. I was 25 when my father died by suicide. And if you lost a friend, a relative, you knew a young person who died by suicide, have a pretty good idea of what you've gone through. But today we're going to focus on what can we all do. And I've long been a big supporter of Guardian Ad Litem because I know having good relationships with a significant adult can make all the difference in the lives of a child. So we're going to go through a number of things today. And once, once I went to a three-hour presentation and the presenter was showing me every chart imaginable about the problem of youth suicide, I finally raised my hand and said, I knew it was a problem, that's why I came in here today. I wanna know what to do about it. And I hope that's what you will feel like after you finish today, that you've learned more about what to do about it. Sadly, youth suicide is a very significant problem. It's the second leading cause of death for everyone in America between the ages of 10 and 34. Suicide is thankfully very rare under the age of 10. When I read of yet another youth suicide, I usually think of it pretty simply. Untreated or undertreated mental illness, often in combination with adverse childhood experiences. All those things we don't want a child to experience. Rejection from a parent, living in poverty, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, living with a family member who's mentally ill or a family member with substance abuse. So unfortunately, the scope of this problem is very significant. The Center for Disease Control weighed in on what we need to do, and they focus on collaboration, partnerships, schools, community, all agencies working together to improve suicide prevention for young people. And then we need available mental health services. Actually worked full time in schools for 26 years. And all schools need to increase their mental health professionals, such as social workers, school counselors, and school psychologists. And again, one person, one caring adult may make all of the difference. And to be honest, I'm not a fan of massive schools, and we have many of them in Florida. And I'll give an example with our youngest daughter. She went to a high school of 4,000. Jill came home in the middle of the school year and said, Dad, my teacher doesn't even know my name. She had me confused with two or three other girls with brown hair and braces. And that's so frustrating. And smaller schools, I happened to grow up in a small town in Kansas. There were only 82 kids in my high school class. What that meant is I was needed. Scott, you want to play football? You bet. Here's the uniform. You know, I'm, you want to march in the band at halftime? Do that too. So we really need to try to make sure that every young person in Florida sincerely feels like somebody cares whether they showed up today at school or not. That's easy, us, easy for us to say, but how do we really increase school connections for all young people? Because being connected to the school, being involved in anything extracurricular is very positive and very preventative. So if I was tuning in today, I would wanna know what works. This actually comes from the World Health Organization. And basically, it's pretty straightforward. 
reducing lethal means available to suicidal individuals. Last summer, I presented in Taiwan. In Taiwan, kids don't use a gun to die by suicide. They use pesticides and poisons. So what they need to do in Taiwan is pretty straightforward, lock up the guns. As mentioned in the introduction, sadly, I have now responded to 16 different school shootings. And I have one simple thing that I'd like to stress today. And please know, I'm not gonna question any adult's right to own a gun. But with that right comes a responsibility to safeguard that gun from a troubled, impulsive, depressed, substance abusing person that might reside in your very own home. And one teenager's goodbye note to her parents had this statement. Why did you make this so easy? Why did you leave this gun available to me? Our schools would be safer. Suicide rates would dramatically be decreased if we simply had gun responsibility in all of our homes. And I've already mentioned trying to interrupt the development of those adverse childhood experiences, but we also need education and awareness for everyone. If I had one simple message that I really want to echo today, it's this. We must talk about suicide more in our homes and our schools and our churches. What to look for, what to do, how to help yourself, how to help your friend. And sadly, about 70% of the individuals who died by suicide actually went to see the family physician shortly before they ended their life. So it's critically important that all physicians are comfortable, competent, will make inquiry. We actually had a national recommendation that came out 10 years ago saying every teenager who sees the physician for any reason should fill out a little questionnaire or be asked direct questions verbally about depression and suicide. And that questionnaire should be scored before they walk out of the doctor's office. Now, my brother called recently. By the way, it's my rich brother. His third home is on the west coast of Florida. Steve called, he was very upset. He said, my neighbor, Bob, was seen in the parking lot two days ago holding a gun to his head. Well, I asked my brother, did somebody rush Bob to the emergency room? No, they didn't. Does Bob still have his guns available to him? Yes, I just spoke with his wife. She said, those are Bob's guns. I couldn't possibly take them away. Steve went on to share with me more about his neighbor, Bob who is suffering from advanced stages of Parkinson. And I said, Steve, I have an idea here. I bet Bob's physician is treating him for Parkinson's, but not for the accompanying depression. I'm actually really proud of my brother. He went to the doctor with Bob. Bob confessed about his suicidal behavior. Bob started on an antidepressant. Bob is in therapy and Bob's guns have been removed. And this is what we all need to do. Work as a team, take action, realize this person is saying something to us that's really serious. Now, I've been working on this problem for nearly 40 years. And too often we say to someone, oh, I know you'd never harm yourself. Sounds like you're having a difficult time. Let me tell you about a difficult time in my life and how I got through it. This is not the time for a pep talk. This is not the time to dismiss their suicidal thought. Instead, we should be responding with, you're not the first kid to feel this way. There is help available. I will get you help. I will be there with you every single step of the way. Now. This is the Florida Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Data for High Schools. By the way, 
It's called the YRBF. It's been done every two years since 1991 in this country. And it's a snapshot. I think the greatest snapshot we have of at-risk behavior for a high school student. Have they gotten fights? Have they been bullied at school, bullied online? Have they ever felt school was not safe? Do they engage in self-injury? Have they been depressed or suicidal? So here's the bottom line. Let's just zero in on the bottom figure there for the high school population. And by the way, I can look out my window right now and I can see Nova Public High School. And for the sake of simple math, I'm going to round their student population off to 2,000, although it is significantly more than that. So what's this data mean with 2,000 kids in a Florida high school? 152 of them made a suicide attempt within the last 12 months. You know what's really scary? For the most part, their teachers, their counselors, their principal, even their parents have no idea about their suicidal behavior. Who's the most likely to make a suicide attempt tomorrow? That would be one of the 152 kids at Nova Public High School with the previous attempt. But who always knows about their suicidal behavior, that would be their friends. The very friends that we've never talked to about what to do, how to help yourself, how to help your friend. And a really simple thing, and I'll just demonstrate it. If I push the button here and tell Siri, I wanna kill myself, what's her response? Do you know? I want to kill myself. It sounds like talking with someone might help. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline offers free and confidential emotional support. All I'd have to do is push the button and say yes, and I would be connected with that National Crisis Helpline. Can you see the importance of every young people, every kid in our state knowing you don't have to remember complicated numbers. Simply push the button on their smartphone and tell Siri. Now, we've been concentrating on high school behavior. Those states that actually survey middle school students, the numbers are even more alarming than what you see in front of you. Question for you. If a youth is really intent on killing themselves, there's nothing anybody can do to stop them. True or false? False. Suicide is very preventable. Suicide is not inherited. It is not destiny. Although I've had kids say to me before, who am I to stop Tom from killing himself today? If he doesn't do it today, he'll do it next week. It was actually a great quote from Voltaire in 1764. And I'm only gonna slightly change his words. The young man in the fit of melancholy who died by suicide today might have wanted to live had he merely waited a week. Can you see what everybody's job is? Get a kid through a difficult afternoon, through a difficult couple of days. And I hope you will all remember this next phrase. I am always going to use the term died by suicide. I do not put the word committed in front of our subject matter today. You tell me my father committed something, I might respond, you commit a crime, you commit a burglary. When you say the word died by, to us survivors who lost our loved ones, it's a lot more acceptable. It seems to imply they traveled a very long road. And even a 12 year old kid traveled a long road. No one person, no one thing is ever to blame after a youth suicide. One more, we talk about suicide, 
we may give young people the idea to kill themselves. This is absolutely false. Giving them the opportunity to talk about it, if they have thoughts of suicide, gives them a chance to unburden themselves, realize they're not alone, help is available. We need to talk in our homes, our schools and churches about the warning signs of suicide and what everybody needs to know to be able to prevent a suicide. One last question for you. Only experts with like a mental health degree can prevent suicide. Absolutely false. You too can save a life. Without a doubt, some of you already have. You see young people on a regular basis. We rely on you to prevent you suicide in our state. Kristen was kind enough to mention the state suicide prevention plans for schools that my wife, a former principal, and I have done. We're just finishing the guide to prevent suicide for the New Jersey schools. And with one of my doctoral students, we're working on a plan for the Florida schools as well. These are all available online, free, with particularly the Montana one has 32 downloadable tools. Across the ages, why is suicide so rare under the age of 10? Under the age of 10, they're a lot more involved with their parents and the adults in their lives. They have a lot less gun access, a lot less likely to have a substance abuse problem. And according to Piaget, they're not in the formal operational stage where they are quite as capable of feeling alienated, isolated, and lonely. But all that changes in the middle school years. In fact, the two groups in our country with the most dramatic rise in suicide rates, middle school age girls, sadly, the rate has doubled in the last decade. And the other group with a dramatic increase, middle-aged Caucasian men. I don't know how many of you might have seen a very popular Netflix program called 13 Reasons Why, but unfortunately, most adolescents saw it, and it had many dangerous messages. If you saw the program, you know that all the adults were portrayed as absent, clueless, or even downright mean. In two full seasons, not a single time was an adult shown as a go-to person for one of those adolescents. If I had the ability tomorrow, I would ask every classroom teacher in our state to ask students, who is your go-to adult? And I'm very concerned when they have no go-to adults in their life. I already gave you the data, second leading cause of death between the ages of 10 and 34. And sadly, it's increased for middle-aged men, and it's always been a very significant problem for the elderly, especially if they have family, financial, and health problems. I can't talk enough about this. And again, I'm gonna go back to, it's a question of responsibility. Guns are the number one method of suicide in our country for most age groups. If someone attempts with a gun, they very rarely get a second chance. Hanging is the most common for a teenager with guns number two for teens. The majority of those who survive a suicide attempt do not ever attempt again. This is well documented through research. There's a wonderful website at Harvard. It's called Means Matter. You raise the barrier on the bridge, 
what they're finally doing on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. You remove the gun, suicide rates drop dramatically. There are a few key myths that I need to dispel. Sometimes people say there were no warning signs. Almost every single time there were significant warning signs. Sometimes they're subtle, but almost always they talked about it. They wrote about it. They had dramatic changes in behavior. They made out a will. They gave away prized possessions. They were overwhelmed with the stress in their lives. A young person who died by suicide traveled a long road. It's something they thought about for a long time. It just didn't happen on a whim or because they snapped today. In all honesty, suicide can run in families, but it's not inherited. It's not destiny. It's more a matter of the modeling and families not really acknowledging and getting the help they need. And in my work, fairly often, I meet a kid who says, why didn't they tell me what happened to my favorite aunt seven years ago? I'm a big believer in telling kids the truth when someone important to them died by suicide and providing them the mental health support all survivors need. I've already pretty well covered the point that we must talk about suicide more. Don't be afraid to bring this up with young people when you can tell they're very troubled and feeling hopeless. So what is this relationship between bullying and suicide? Well, research is never gonna find a causal relationship because how can you rule out other adverse childhood experiences besides being the victim of bullying? And how can you rule out untreated or undertreated mental illness? But there's a strong association. So what's the key message I want you to remember today? If a young person you are trying to help, you are aware they are the victim of bullying, do not hesitate to ask them questions about hopelessness, giving up, and thoughts of suicide. Now there's a behavior that really pretty much exploded with adolescents in the last two decades. A conservative estimate would be 8% of all adolescents engage in non-suicidal self-injury, with the most common form being cutting or burning. You might be wondering, why do they do it? Cutting releases endorphins. That's a biological reason. It also regulates emotions. That's a psychology reason because it shuts out the argument somebody is having in the next room. But non-suicidal self-injury is a complex behavior, fulfills a multitude of needs for these young people. By the way, just know telling them to stop or being horrified is not going to help. We need to help them set a goal of diminishing the behavior, learning substitute strategies, getting them the help that they need. But there are estimates that approximately one third of the young people who repeatedly engage in self-injury, they disassociate when they self-injure. They feel very little pain when they self-injure. Those are the ones that are likely to ultimately make a suicide attempt. Cutting behavior, burning of the skin has diminishing returns, not working as well as it did a few months ago for that young person. So there is a relationship between suicide and self-injury. Here's Joyner's model, the most widely accepted model of suicide. But let's be honest. A lot of young people have the desire for suicide. They perceive themselves as a burden, think others would be better off with them dead. 
and we have a lot of young people in our Florida massive schools that don't feel that sense of connection to a school, to a community, to a family, or to a church. But we really have to watch out for what is called habituating or acquiring the capability to harm themselves. Self-injury is getting comfortable harming one's body. An extreme eating disorder, getting comfortable with a young person starving themselves or strange injuries because of reckless behavior and chances that they are taking with their well-being. Here are the consensus warning signs for young people. We've always thought of warning signs like giving away prized possessions, dramatic changes in behavior, making out a will, talking about death, dying, and suicide, writing about it. In fact, I remember a poem that I was handed 38 years ago, one day too late. The young woman wrote in a poem entitled A Small Flower, come and touch me, hold me, use me for a gift to someone, for an arrangement in the den, for anything. Please don't toss me out while my leaves are fresh. If they do turn brown and crinkle, please remember what I was before I faded away. Now, that's not the most explicit suicidal poem you've ever heard, but it certainly had heartache and non-existence. What do you think her English teacher wishes 38 years later? She'd have just sat down with her. Are these your thoughts? You're not the first person to feel this way. There is help available. I will be there for you every single step of the way. The second poem the young lady wrote, I don't know it all by heart, but it was entitled, Dear Sir, Father, don't blame me for not knowing you. I have the picture of you holding me once. It was the last time and why. Additional consensus warning signs, being overwhelmed with emotional pain and distress. And we really need to look at sleep deprivation for our young people. There's at least a movement not to have high schools in this country ever start before 8.30 in the morning. I was in an Orlando high school. The bell rang at five minutes after seven. Our adolescents are chronically sleep deprived and sleep deprivation is connected to suicidal thought and depression. High risk youth, these are the youth that you're all involved with. And what do I mean by exposure to suicide? When a young person dies by suicide, think of it this way. It's like taking a rock and throwing it into a pond. That ripple effect is the school, the entire community, the churches. And you could probably answer this question for me, but why is the impact of a youth suicide greater today than ever before? That's because of social networks. With colleagues, I just finished two articles about the impact of social media on youth suicide. We already talked about bullies and victims. There's actually a category called victim perpetrator. You're the bully in some situations, the victims in another situation. When we have a kid involved in bullying, whether they're the bully or the victim, we shouldn't hesitate to ask them questions about hopelessness and suicide. You're probably all pretty familiar with the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender young people have suicide deaths and attempts four to eight times that of their heterosexual peers. But it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It has to do with crap and rejection they get in their life. My good friend Michael said to me, Scott, when I came out 19 years ago, my dad said, Michael, you are dead to me. 
Michael's dad hasn't spoken to him in 19 years. How do we stop that from happening in our families? Homeless and runaway children, very much at risk, as are children in foster care. What's the most common precipitating event? I've been stressing that young people have traveled a very long road, but what is it that actually causes them to act on their previously thought out suicidal plans? A loss, a loss of relationship, loss of a loved one to death, being exposed to violence, a pretty severe school crisis, whether it be academic or disciplinary. I wish every assistant principal in the state would realize that when you are suspending and expelling a student in our state, you need to inquire about whether they're gonna be able to handle this. You need to suggest Let's have you talk to the counselor before you leave the building today. Because I can give you examples where kids left the expulsion conference, went home immediately, and followed through on their suicidal plans. Obviously, family crisis, especially a severe argument with the parent, often precipitates a suicide attempt. All of us our gatekeepers. Four out of five youth say something, do something, write or draw something that comes to the attention of adult or a peer. In the Guardian Ad Litem program, you connect with our youth. You must be alert for warning signs. Trust your instinct. Act directly about suicidal thoughts and plans get help, work as a team. These are the critical things for all of you to do. I can't overemphasize the importance of direct questions, and I've given you an entire sampling of them. Sounds like things are really difficult, maybe even hopeless. And by the way, if I had a simple piece of advice for all adults, and I've worked extensively with parents after Columbine, parents after Parkland. The bottom line is find the time when the young person will truly talk to you. Reach out, do not preach. Primarily be in a listening mode. Have you thought about giving up? Have you thought you might want to go to sleep and not wake up? Would you actually harm yourself? Do you have a plan? Have you ever actually tried to end your life? And we're emphasizing, we're going to be there for them every single step of the way. These answers, will guide the volunteer child advocates to ensure safety for the young person. How do we determine what's an immediate risk? Do they have a plan? Do they have the means? We got to stay with them, totally supervise them, get them to an emergency room, call for a mobile crisis response unit, call 911. But sometimes, there's a serious risk, but it's not immediate. There's no plan. They don't have the means. Now we've got to get the treatment team, all the caregivers, the case manager involved. And there's no substitute for a suicide assessment done by a trained mental health professional. But one of the most widely used assessment instruments in this country is called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. We had Kelly Posner from the Columbia Lighthouse Project 
here in our community. She said, anyone can ask these questions, anyone of any age. And the Columbia has been translated into 100 languages. I sort of joke that I spent an entire career making sure these three critical questions are asked. Are you thinking about suicide now? Have you ever actually attempted suicide before? Tell me, how would you end your life? One kid in Houston, Texas said, I'll tell you how, I'm gonna jump off a cliff. You ever been to Houston, Texas? There's not a cliff for a hundred miles. I'm keeping him with me. I'm calling his family, talking to his parents, but not with the same urgency as the kid who says, I'm gonna shoot myself with the pistol. I had it out last night. I pointed it at my head. And if you were to look up the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale online, you would see that they took my three questions and turned them into six very important questions. Stay engaged. Ensure that there's follow-up and support. And every young person you interact with needs to know how to contact the National Crisis Helpline. You can be a lifesaver. Suicide is preventable. What's it really rest on? A caring person with the right knowledge available in the right place at the right time. One caring adult and the life of the youth is the greatest protective factor there is. Something I'm really proud to tell you, 45 years ago, I signed up to be a big brother to a 13-year-old kid, Rodney, in Muncie, Indiana. Rodney and I have had a very rewarding relationship, 45 years and still counting. What was the bottom line? Rodney didn't have anybody. He never knew his dad. His mom was on welfare. Rodney actually graduated from high school. He never got arrested. He never did drugs. And I'd like to think in some small way, I had a part in that. Kids, they can be very resilient. Uh, there's treatment for all of the risk factors. And Guardian Ad Lighten is part of that important circle of care for children in our state. I'd be remiss today not to say just a few words about all that technology. Kids spend many hours on those screens. There's a lot of research talking about they're actually isolated. They're more depressed than any other generation. Those screens are under the pillow. They're interfering with sleep because they're getting a text message at 2.30 in the morning in the middle of their sleep cycle. The adults and children's lives need to take charge of technology. All that technology, it is a privilege. It's not a right. Bullying, which we've talked about a little bit, tends to peak in middle school. Certainly it does continue through high school. There's research saying if you were bullied in school, it might affect you for as long as the next decade. The most common forms are obviously being made fun of in person, being the subject of rumors, being pushed, shoved, kicked, tripped, even spit on. And sometimes I hear this from the adults. Well, that definition of bullying, it has to be repetitive. It's nasty, it's humiliating, it's all about power. All that's true. But then they say, only one thing was posted online. Therefore, it doesn't meet the definition of being repetitive. But wait a minute, if 48 kids piled on, supported the humiliating message or even added to it, I believe it meets the definition. Only one third of bullying victims told an adult. Why is that? 
By the way, do you know what I really believe about school shootings and youth suicides? Nearly 100% of them should have been prevented because kids always talk to each other about being the victim of bullying, being suicidal, planning the next school shooting. So what's the real question? Why don't they go to an adult for help? Here's what they say. I have been conditioned not to tell. Unfortunately, you can all complete this sentence for me. Snitches get, yes, you all know, that last word is stitches. Don't you wish they all know? Instead, see something, say something. Kids will also say, I didn't think it could happen. I feared retaliation. I didn't want to get involved. And perhaps the thing that bothers me the most is the research says they don't have a trusted go-to adult in their life. You can be that trusted go-to adult. So this slide has to do with some of the dangers about that excessive time on their screens. I already mentioned the isolation, depression, and even addiction. Not to mention, it interferes with developing social skills, reduces free play and exercise. I'm a very big believer that all kids need to be told the truth in developmentally appropriate language. And I well know the typical responses a child has to a traumatic event, they regress academically, they regress behaviorally. I often find the adults at school and in a kid's life have a very short memory when we know that a traumatic event impacts them for months or even years. Nightmares and sleeping problems, worry about the future. These aren't the unusual reactions. These are pretty much the every time reactions. So we want routines to be resumed as quickly as possible in our homes and schools. We need to provide support. I'm here to listen anytime you wanna talk. I can't imagine what that might be like for you. We need to reach out and we need to be there for them and recognize these are the typical reactions. And we need to respond with patience, structure, tolerance, and love. And one of the greatest things that we can do is help the adults first, help the caregivers first, help the teachers first, help the adults in the family. And very important to monitor and restrict television viewing of tragic events. And now resiliency, arguably the biz, biggest word in all of psychology and counseling post 9-11. More about that in just a moment. Here's what I sometimes hear from a mom or a dad. How do I know my daughter is actually depressed? I mean, come on, aren't all teenagers moody, irritable? I think she's preparing me for, she's going away to college next year. And mom and dad, let me ask you a couple of questions. Is this pervasive? Yes, as a matter of fact, it's affecting homeschool and peers. Is it persistent? Has it gone on for two or three weeks or more? Yes, it has. Has she dropped out of what was previously a pleasurable activity? Yes, I couldn't believe it. She was always on the dance team. She doesn't care about it this year. Mom and dad, you have a depressed teenager. Get her help. The literature estimates 20% of all teens suffer from depression at some point during the tumultuous adolescent years. It also 
says 80% of them receive no treatment whatsoever. We need to all be alert for those persistent warning signs that are pervasive. And particularly if they've dropped out of something that was previously pleasurable, they may be withdrawing from peers, from family, more irritable, making statements about hopelessness, lack energy, changes in eating and sleeping patterns. I also believe strongly that the adults in kids' lives have to keep up with the latest technology. It's not an easy task, but all school districts have technology experts that need to be helping all caregivers to know the latest and the most worrisome things that are happening online. And if I could talk to every caregiver in our state, I would say to them, take charge of four cabinets in your home. Lock up the medicine cabinet, lock up the gun cabinet, lock up the liquor cabinet, and take charge of the internet. And I also believe that all children do far more right than wrong. We need to catch them being good and their worth as a person and our love for them should never be in question. We need to separate their misbehavior from their work of being a child and their worth as a person. By the way, at the simplest level, what do I think the work of a kid is? Getting along reasonably well with everybody in their lives, siblings, family, neighbors, having reasonable behavior and academic performance at school. And kids need to receive rewards when they're doing a good job with the work of being a kid. These are the protective factors that come from the World Health Organization. They're pretty straightforward. Having a good relationship with other youth. But who does a kid who's disturbed with a lot of problems turn to? Unfortunately, maybe not to somebody listening in today, they turn to another disturbed kid and between two of them, they don't have enough sense to get one of you involved. Access to mental health care, critically important, but if you don't have insurance or live in an affluent family, health care is a challenge throughout our country. And religion is a wonderful protective factor, whether it's the mosque, the temple, or the church. And our schools need to focus on wellness and connections for every single student. Family cohesion and stability. We want that for every single kid, but the kids that you interact with, family cohesion and stability has been a problem. And something I've said repeatedly to Parkland parents is this simple. When a kid lives in a stable home, when they are shown unconditional love every day, every way, I believe they can overcome almost anything. Resiliency. What are the keys to being resilient? It's primarily a learned behavior. So what are the keys to it? Being surrounded by caring family and friends having opportunities to vent strong emotions, utilizing problem-solving skills, keeping an optimistic view. Those are the keys to being able to bounce back from adversity. The Carnegie Foundation weighed in about what children in the United States need for success. They said three or more significant adults in the lives of every kid in addition to parents. 
most of us have decided, let's try for one, one significant caring adult who's always going to be there for that kid. Sense of safety and security and their home, school, and community. Three or more hours of organized activities weekly. At one end of the spectrum, when I speak to parents in our affluent private schools in our state, it's like those kids have too many activities. Their club team, their school team, their club or community play interferes with the school activities. I like to say to affluent parents, don't you want your kid to have their life revolve around your family? How about one activity a season? But the other end of the spectrum, most kids have no activities. I'm reminded of Leroy, a kid that I counseled for years. One day, and he was about nine, he walks into my office and says, Dr. Poland, you know what I wanna do more than anything? I just wanna play little league baseball. Great, Leroy. I know where the forms are. I saw them in the office. Let's go get it, sign you up. He says, you don't understand. My mom doesn't have the $70. Even if she did, she worked nights. I could never even get to a little league practice. That's unfortunately the reality for far too many kids. Volunteer work for adolescents is needed. There's a great quote, it's one of my favorites. Perhaps the only way an adolescent can truly find themselves is through service to other people. Volunteer work helps them understand that little upset, that problem you had with your 14 year old friend, you can kind of put that in perspective when you see the huge challenges many people face. And I'm a big believer, this next generation of young people, they may change our country and we need to stand behind them because after traumatic events like Parkland, they want to make a difference. Key messages, that I hope you'll remember. Be involved and be present in the lives of all those children you care so much about. As the volunteer child advocate, you may be one of, or maybe the only stable influence in that child's life. You can be the difference and thank you for all of your service. There's the website for the Suicide and Violence Prevention Office here at Nova Southeastern University that I co-direct. There is my personal email. There are important associations and resources, especially our Florida Suicide Prevention Specialist. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm going to turn it back to Kristen. Thank you so much, Dr. Poland. I'm sure if they're um, if they were not on mute, you'd hear a lot of applause right now. I learned a lot, and I really appreciate you speaking with our team because, you know, as a part of the Guardian Ad Litem program. We pride ourselves on being that one stable and constant adult in our children's lives, and we oftentimes know them the best. And so it was um, really, you know, just right on with kind of how I feel our role is and who we are in our children's lives and the potential for us to really make a difference and be there for them um, when we when we're their advocates and their voice. I did get a couple questions that I would love to ask you. Um, one of the questions was in Florida, do you know how often teachers receive mental health training? Well, that's a great question. There is a state initiative right now about how many hours of mental health information 
is to be provided to secondary students. But I don't think anybody really has the answer about how much mental health training our teachers receive. And in particular, I believe all teachers need annual training on suicide prevention. But my experience is that does not happen. Too much of the emphasis is on how do we raise our test scores and important prevention information and mental health information often is overlooked. Uh, that's an excellent point. And, you know, as you said, our, our teachers are with our children so much during the work week and, and have such, you know, wonderful relationships with them that it, it's really important that they receive training on mental health and the, and the signs to look out for. So hopefully that's something that as we move forward here in the state of Florida with focusing on mental health and the first lady, um, Ms. DeSantis is very in touch with this and it's one of her priorities and she's focusing a great deal on it. And so hopefully we can see some changes. Um, so do you know, I mean, kind of in line with that, I know that the state is moving forward with looking at investing more into these particular issues in mental health. Do you know right now um, the state of Florida investing additional money or adding counseling and mental health specialists to the school system. I know there was a lot of talk and discussion and a lot of action taken after the tragedy at Parkland. Um, do you know kind of more details that we can talk to the um, panel or to the group about? Well, yes. Um, there was a lot of increased funding for mental health in schools, which I think we all support. But the legislature was made aware that to meet the recommended ratios from professional associations, the number of school psychologists in our state needs to quadruple. The number of school counselors needs to double. The number of social workers in schools needs to increase tenfold. And there are problems with moving towards those goals. Many of them are financial but also we have to attract more people into those particular professions. I know that Palm Beach County had a wonderful initiative and has dramatically increased the mental health professionals in their county schools. And I believe it was a result of passing a local bond issue, specifically adding money for mental health. I was fortunate this last May, June, and July, I provided suicide prevention training to school personnel from every school district in the state. They also received training on assessing threats of violence. So that's all the result of some of our initiatives in the state to improve schools' ability to assess threats of violence towards others or assess threats of violence towards self. Okay. And um, the last question I have from the group is, um, do you, are you aware of any mental health classes available to parents in small or low income counties in Florida and what those resources are for our caregivers? Okay, that is a great question. and. One thing I'm really proud to tell you, and it's uh, online, but locally the Pembroke Pines Charter Schools had me do two different presentations about raising children in challenging times. And I was absolutely astounded that the very first session, 2,200 parents attended. And obviously I asked, how do you get all these parents here? And the bottom line is that charter school system has a waiting list. And when your kid is accepted, you must participate in parent trainings. If I had the ability to do it, I would love to require parent trainings throughout the state because I do believe that school mental health professionals are eager to provide those trainings. Sometimes they're frustrated though because they put a lot of work into parent training 
and nobody shows up. So whatever ideas people have to actually get parents to come and receive training that is only going to benefit their child and improve their parenting abilities. Let's be honest, it's a very challenging world out there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And all the support that we can provide our families, um, you know, is just all that more important. And it really can be that that step and that opportunity that helps them recognize something and have those tough conversations. And, you know, a common theme is these are these are hard conversations and we do have to talk, you know, start talking about it. And I think the more resources we can give the adults that are in these children's lives on how to have that conversation, especially with children. Um, I think some people, you know, we shy away from it because it's a subject that you shouldn't be talking about with a young child. So I think the more resources that we give them on how to do it and how to broach the subject and to not be afraid to ask the question, I think is so important. I completely agree with you. Um, the, we did have one more come in, so before I say the last one, I apologize. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts on recommendations for social media access for children? Um, I know we talked a lot about um, online and having access to the computers, and you know, there's that um, that line of kids. It's the normal thing to do now, and you want our children to be like their peers and but you have a lot of parents who are also starting to step in in the private sector. And when you have a child who's in dependency and the state is now their parent and we're trying to make those recommendations on what's best for a child, are there thoughts out there or any guidelines that come into play when it comes to when is an okay age to start allowing your child to have um, a social media presence? I'm a very big fan of what's called common sense media commonsensemedia.org. They have digital citizenship by every grade level. They make recommendations about developmentally what's appropriate with regards to various social networks, with regards to television programs, movies, video games. In general, I just believe strongly that adults need to pay more attention to what's going on and don't be in such a hurry. I'm sure everybody listening has been in a restaurant. Mom or dad come in with their three-year-old kid. They want them to be quiet. What's the first thing they do? Hand them the phone so the kid can like surf around or play a game. We really need to help kids to be able to just talk with their family and what i often hear when i make recommendations like this i have the wife in a family says i'm all for a technology free meal time but it's my husband he will not put down his devices and to go very specifically to suicide prevention and social networks we really need kids that are going to be putting a message out there. This is sad. It doesn't have to keep happening. If you know somebody who's suicidal, get adult help. So we need the social network messages to be one of hope and what to do, as opposed to messages that appear to promote suicidal behavior or describe it as the answer. To a problem. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate those resources that you've put out there for our team. Um, the other thing, in regards to education on suicide prevention, you know, you talked a lot about how you know guns are the number one um, means for suicide currently. Um, the question that came in was, um, is the NRA doing any education on suicide prevention? I'm not aware of a specific NRA initiative. I am aware that Western states have very high suicide rates and very high percentage of gun owners. In Western states, it's not unusual in the gun shop 
for there to be little flyers on the counter about suicide prevention and warning signs. And I'd like to make one more statement. About 50% of our states require suicide prevention in schools, meaning it's mandated. The ones I like the best, mandated annually. Some other states, it's mandated every three years. But unfortunately, the state of Florida does not require any suicide prevention in schools. And I believe that it is strongly needed. The state does allow a school to become suicide prevention certified, but that needs to be promoted more and we just need to decide as a state, what's the minimum that every school system, every school must do to try to prevent the second leading cause of death for all students over the age of 10? We need to mandate it and we need to check and make sure that it's actually being done. And in that Montana guide that I referenced, I said something like this, my hope is the next generation of Montanans will know exactly what to do to prevent suicide and Montana will not continue to lead the state in suicide, to lead the nation in suicides. Okay. Well, I, I think you've given us some, some great input and some advice today and a lot of things for us to think about and I'm, you know, I am very encouraged with us starting the conversation and, you know, how we can get more engaged in this subject as an organization with our counterparts uh, across the state and bringing awareness to this very important topic as it relates to our children. So on that note, Dr. Poland, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, for everyone out there, this was recorded and it will be on our I Am For The Child Academy um, by the end of the week. If you need to reference back to Dr. Poland's web, um, PowerPoint presentation, it will be included with the recording on the I Am For The Child Academy so you can access it there by the end of the week. Thank you all for joining us today. And Dr. Poland, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome.